Hello, Googleization Nation, and welcome to Decoding HR Tech, a GGG Unleashed podcast with Amy Warren of Fama. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. In each of Amy's episodes, we'll reimagine everything you thought you knew about HR tech. Let's begin. Welcome to Decoding HR Tech. I'm Amy Warren, and I'm excited for our discussion today on ethical AI, specifically what you should be thinking about when talking to vendors who have an AI component in their product. I'm joined today with Brenton Ekstad, our Chief Technology Officer at Fama Technologies. And Brenton, welcome to the show and to this conversation. It's good to have you. Thanks, Amy. Glad to be here. And before we jump into the topic, what I wanted to have you do was share your background a little bit with our listeners. Sure. As you said, I'm the CTO here at Fama. I've been here about two years. And uh, prior to that, I spent 20 plus years in other companies doing software development and data science work and got the opportunity to come to Fama and put all that together into one package. Here we are doing the interesting work of machine learning and AI for HR tech. That's really helpful. And that's why I wanted you to share that with everyone, because this is what you work in day in and day out. And so first, I want you to talk a little bit about how we use AI here at Fama. The way we use AI at Fama is primarily around text and video analysis. So we do a lot of things where we will use natural language processing to analyze the written word and break it down into its components and then analyze those components to try to find things that may be indicative of behaviors that are shown in social media and web content that are indicative of things that, that employers may be interested in knowing about people that they're looking to hire. We also do the same thing with video. And so we analyze the video and do the same thing. Look for, look for uh, images that may be, may be interesting to be flagged for follow-up. Yeah, we use RAI pretty much to look for workplace misconduct issues. So, you know, it's going out and doing what a person can't do, right? Because neither one of us, you or I, can't sit here and go and review 10,000 sources and be able to look for a person's public online content, right? We just can't do that. But the other thing we can't do is we can't just let the AI do everything because there is an ethical component to that. If we were to just let the AI go out and pull up all of the content and put it into our reports and determine everything that's workplace misconduct, why wouldn't that work? I explain that a little bit to our listeners, because this is, I think, key when you're looking at a potential vendor that has an AI component in their product. There's a number of things in terms of bias that you would need to watch out for in, in AI and ML applications. And there's biases that relate to things like seeing uh, potentially unprotected data and being able to correlate that to protected data. So there's that aspect of it. There's also using data that is, is in its own right biased in the sense that it's representative of only a small group of a whole, those types of things. And so you always have to have people involved in the, the process of building and maintaining AI and ML. It's not something you can just train once and let go on its own and always just run and make decisions. You also have to be making sure that it's doing the right thing and uh, correcting it when it's not. And for those who may not know, what is ML? <laughs> Machine learning. We know that internally, but I wanted you to share that with everyone. And, and the other thing that you talked about too was protected data. So what do you mean when you say protected data? So protected data would be things that you would not be able to use or even know about necessarily in a hiring decision. So things like ethnicity, race, religion, those types of things. So those are all protected data that you shouldn't be using in your hiring decision. And there's, there's correlatable things where you can actually say something like, for instance, zip code could actually be used as a proxy for race 
based on demographics of a certain area of a city or something like that. So you have to be really careful of those tangential things that are not protected actually showing you protected information. Yeah, that makes sense. So you needed to make sure that you're not programming your AI to do a search based on zip code because that search in it of itself could potentially be bringing bias into the equation. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure that your algorithms and your training data are not causing a correlation there that you don't want to actually be in the data or in the algorithms and model. When we do this at Fama, how do we ensure from a perspective that we don't have those things happening and that we're actually practicing the term that's called ethical AI? What are some of the things that we do here and that people should be looking for in an organization that they may be bringing on board using as a vendor that um, has an AI component in their product. Fama looks at ethical AI in a number of different ways. There's a lot of different definitions of it out there. There's a lot of different frameworks that sort of talk about what ethical AI is and how to practice it. To me, it really boils down to a couple things. It's making sure that you first answer the question, should we be doing this? So is this something that we, that, that brings positivity and is, can be used for good, or is it something that potentially we shouldn't be doing at all? So that's sort of the first question. And then the second question is around, how do you make sure that you don't introduce those biases? Some of those biases that we talked about, it, you know, making sure that we don't add those into our models in a way that makes it unfair. Uh, or biased to any particular group or viewpoint or, or things like that. Um, so for us, the way we, you know, we approach it is first and foremost, it's about having the best data. So the way machine learning and, and artificial intelligence works is it's trained on and learns from the data that is given. It's only as good as the data that it receives and that we have picked for it to learn on. And so making sure that the data is unbiased and representative is really important in ensuring that it doesn't skew the learning aspects of the algorithms into making bad decisions or making biased decisions. Then you also need to have proper oversight. So humans do need to be in the loop. I, I firmly believe that the models are only as good as uh, they can be based on the mathematics that go on behind the scenes of machine learning. And people always can spot the biases and the trends in the model's predictions that the model itself can't recognize, right? So if it starts trending towards looking like it's, it's deviating from a unbiased set of predictions, that's when you would need to start looking at ways that the humans that are responsible for this machine learning model are retraining it, are making sure that it's learning the right things and predicting the right things without bias. We all know what happened to Amazon, right? They went out and they used their modeling to try and hire and their AI modeling brought back a completely biased result. And a part of the reason that was because I think the team that was developing it wasn't maybe necessarily diverse or there's a whole component and levels of diversity that you have to have in this, because if you don't have a diverse team looking at the modeling, they're not going to maybe pick up some nuanced issues that could be presented in the model itself because it was not created by a diverse team. hundred percent. That's really the core of it is diversity of of thought and diversity of perspective on the team that that creates and curates the machine learning models really is paramount in all of this because obviously humans have bias as well. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, exactly. The data is created <laughs> by humans. The data comes from us and our biases then get represented in the machine learning out, uh, models if we're not doing our part to remove that bias. And the best way to do that is to make sure that you have a team that brings all kinds of different perspectives to the table and can catch those types of, most of the time, 
unconscious biases that could be put into the data. Because to use your, your Amazon example, they didn't set out to just hire white males. They didn't right. say, oh, we want to be biased <laughs> to do that. But that's what actually happened. And it's probably to your point because of the demographics of that team. And I, I don't know the details of it, so I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here. But I think there's a good chance that that's what happened. And there were just blind spots there that led the team and then the model down the wrong path. I think that that kind of dovetails nicely into when someone's considering a product that uses AI, what questions should they be asking to make sure that the AI is being applied in an appropriate and ethical way? It's largely asking the question of what the team that creates and curates the models, what that team looks like and understanding that they do take these types of things very seriously. So, you know, asking them, do you understand what ethical AI is? Do you understand how bias can be introduced and, and some of the ways to actually combat that bias and make sure that they're on that same page with you? Because, uh, you know, like we said, if you don't have a diverse team, if you don't have the mindset that AI should be only used in ethical ways, you're going to potentially introduce something to the world that, that you don't necessarily want. But then also the, the human in the loop aspect of, of training and retraining the model and making sure that the model continues to, to be unbiased as possible is really important. So to me, having that, that human in the loop aspect to machine learning is extremely important. And so I would always ask that question too. Is this a, a model that was trained once and never gets looked at again? Or do you go back and retrain it regularly on data that has been labeled by human beings that are unbiased or as unbiased as possibly can be? And you know what I like the most about that guidance is you don't have to be a technology person to ask those questions and understand the answers to it. It's really very, very simple that anytime you work with a vendor who, or thinking of looking to work with a vendor who has an AI component in their product, it's just a matter of asking, how many times do you retrain the model? Have you retrained the model? Do you have diverse teams? Do you have a human in the workflow process? And all of us can understand those questions and those answers and not feel like we have to have a technical person in the room to ask those. And if anybody stumbles over those questions, right, this is my next question for you. When, when should you be wary right, of working with a vendor um, that's using AI? If they can't answer these questions honestly and in a way that, that makes you feel comfortable about the way the machine learning has been implemented and the way it's being used at a human level, uh, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't need to be asking the details of what algorithm was used or how many features are in the vectors and things like that. You don't need to know that. You just need to ask human level questions. And if you don't feel comfortable with the answers or they can't give you the answers that you're looking for, then you should use your human intuition to say, this isn't for me. I think sometimes a lot of us who may not have a technical background or a really strong technical background tend to stay away from asking some questions because, you know, maybe we think we need to have a lot of experience or something. And these are the really easy, basic ways that you can get an understanding of whether or not a provider that you're going to be bringing on board or solution you're going to be bringing on board is going to work for you. And I think when it comes to AI, I think this is so key and so important. So, Thank you, Brenton, for joining us today. This is a lot of really great information shared. And you know, I just want to let everyone know that if you want to learn more about what we do at Fama, you can visit us at www.fama.io. And I also want to invite everyone to join us on our next episode of Decoding HR Tech on GGG Unleashed. Thanks, everybody. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and learning about the future of HR Tech. We'll be back next month with Amy for another episode. But until then, please check out Fama's website at fama.io. That's F-A-M-A dot I-O. Until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans.